accepted life that only he can give. Beneath the crushing weight of sin, Jesus has offered to take away the burden and renew within. Have you exchanged your dirty rags for robes of glory? And have you put your faith in Jesus Christ alone? The choice is offered now to you. So my friend, what will you do? Choose Jesus Christ today. Choose Jesus, don't delay. Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Let me say a couple of things before we read, and when we start, we'll be in Mark chapter 2, verse 1. All right? Am I too close, or are we okay? Okay? All right. I'm going to let you meet everybody. Um, uh, uh, let me see here. Well, Lindsay's gone, uh, but Evangelist Frank Finney led singing and sang this morning. And then Lindsay, his wife, played the piano. And they've got four kids that are here, Alyssa and uh, Ethan and Juliana and Elijah. So you want to meet them if you can after the service. And then my wife is here. Pat, would you stand up just quickly so they can... This is my wife, Mary, and we celebrated number 51 in our anniversary back in December. So I know you're just worried to death about this. I'm 75, so, so you'll know that I'm 75, and I've been 75 since December. So that's pretty good. I'm actually in my 76th year. So everybody Six got this straight now, you know that. I was 10 when the ranch began, and I remember that 
of course, very well. Appreciate your giving to the Campership Fund. We came up with the name Campership from uh, the word scholarship. You know how you have a scholarship to get in school? Well, this is a campership to get in camp. And not the first deaf teenager has paid the first dime to come to the Bill Rice Ranch for these years, and that's been wonderful. And you folks have helped with the Campership Fund now for several years, and I appreciate that very much. That's great. On the shelf, the table, the bench, and the back are several books from the ranch. Not that many, actually, but there are uh, five, I call them white books. There's actually, I think, four of these and one yellow book, and these books are all about 60 pages and just helpful. This one is on friendship, a friend indeed, and there's one back there about the internet. Um, it's about, uh, I can never remember the name, but it's tweets, puns, and posts, something like that. It's about the internet. It's really very helpful. There's one back there about uh, the so-called gay marriage movement that's kindly written and authoritatively written from the Bible. It's just excellent. Um, there's one back there on, uh, um, it's just a fun book actually. It's the, the book that's yellow. And it's just a fun book about stories that have happened with us in the ministry. So they're all back to their $5 a piece. Um, which way is up is normally seven bucks. But you can get it this morning for $5. And there are a couple of other books back there, so I hope you'll look at that. How many of you are planning on being in the service tonight? Can I see your hand? Wonderful. Great. Okay. Well, we'll love to have you. <coughs> Starts at 6, doesn't it, Pastor? Yes. And we'd love to have you in the service this evening. You got Mark chapter 2? Let's look down, if you would, at verse 1 in Mark chapter 2. And again, he, that's the Lord Jesus, entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he, Jesus, preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said to them, why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up the bed, and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way unto thine house. Father, help us, I ask now, in these next few minutes, as we look at this passage of Scripture, to see what you've said, and help us to remember it, and learn from it, and live in light of it, I pray. And we ask these things in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. Amen. How many of you people remember flannel graph? Does anybody here besides me? Okay, six or eight. Flannel graph was a, um, it is a board, <coughs> like, like a blackboard, maybe about this size. It's usually standing on a tripod. And it had a cloth on it. And the teacher would take figures like paper cutouts figures that had the same cloth on the back think of velcro think of velcro and they would put that on the flannel graph store and when i was a kid many many years ago when i was a child we used to use or i used to go and see stories told in flannel graph and this is one of the big flannel graph stories because it has a lot of visuals to it. 
Now, there are some incidentals that are not clearly given in the story in Mark chapter 2. But I know everything about this story because I remember flannel graph. For example, how do they let the man down to see Jesus? It was simple. They had ropes. There were four men, and they lowered the man down to see Jesus. Now you say, are you sure that's the way it happened? I've seen the flannel graph. So, yes, that's the way it happened. How did they cut the roof off? Well, evidently they had saws and hammers and stuff, and they took the roof off. Actually, it came in sections so they could lower the man down to Jesus. And then when this poor sick man was healed, what was it like? Well, the crowd was joyous, and he was able, as Jesus had said, to walk home carrying his bed. What was his bed like? It was two poles with material like canvas between them that could easily be rolled up and the poles could be carried over a man's shoulder. Now, is that the way it really happened? I don't know. It probably is fairly close. The one incidental that nobody would have known without flannel graph is how they got on the roof. It's really very simple. There was a staircase on the side of the house that led to the roof. Now, why people would have a stairway to the roof, I don't know. Although we are told that the roof in some cases, in first century what we would say Palestine, was used a little bit like a porch. So they, they may have been able to go on the roof that way. We don't know. But the story says that four men brought their friend to the Lord Jesus Christ, and there he was healed. Now, the friend was a paralytic, so he couldn't walk. I'm assuming he would have been gnarled and not able to use his hands well either. And he was carried by four. Why four men? I don't know. Again, the Bible doesn't say. What we typically think of is that there was one man on each corner of the bed that carried this dear palsied, sick man to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they did, Jesus saw their faith and responded to it. Now, I've often pictured this. This doesn't come from flannel graph. This just comes from me. You're down in the house when suddenly men are tearing the roof off of the house. And, of course, there'd be dust coming down, wouldn't there be? You'd hear all the noise up there, so everybody would look up would they not? And this dust is falling down and people are looking up and they're getting dust in their eyes. And here's what I've always pictured. One of the four men didn't have all of his teeth. The Bible doesn't say that. I've just pictured it this way. And so when, when the roof was torn off of the house or partially removed from the house, I can just see this one man looking down at the people underneath with a big smile on his face and no teeth in his mouth. It would have been quite a sight, don't you think? Now, we don't know if that happened, and I'll tell you what we do know. Number one, we know there was a large crowd. How large was the house? I don't know, but there was a large crowd. The crowd was so large that if there were windows, and I'm certain there would have been, they couldn't put the man through the window. You'd think they would do that before tearing off the roof, wouldn't you? But they couldn't because the crowd was in the house and evidently surrounding the house and, and perhaps in any kind of courtyard. My dad used to say, a full house is a great crowd no matter the size of the house. Well, that's true, isn't it? In other words, if you have a building that can seat 88, that's when this one seats, and it's full, that's a good crowd, isn't it? If you have a building that seats 700 or 1,000 and it's full, that's a great crowd. So there was a great crowd in this house when Jesus was there. Number two, he preached the gospel unto them. He preached unto them the word of God. Now that's interesting to me because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, could do no better than to preach the Bible. That's what the pastor does here every week, and that's what we um, attempt to do this morning. Simply tell you 
what the Bible says. And if God's Son could preach the Bible, then I think preachers in our day and time should as well. Don't you? Then we come to one of the big questions of this story, and that is why did the men bring their palsied friend to the Lord Jesus? It's fairly simple to answer. Here he was. He couldn't walk. He couldn't care for himself, but he did have four friends that were burdened for him, and these four friends brought him to Jesus. So the question is, why did they bring him? Well, you know the answer, so let me ask you, and you can fill in the blank, all right? These four men brought their friend to Jesus because they believed if they would just get him to Jesus, he would be blank. Okay, you want to try this? Okay, I'll let you say the word. I'll go through the sentence and you say the word, all right? These four men brought their friend to Jesus because they believed if they could get him to Christ, he would be... Yeah. Okay, you know that's what I would have said. And did you know it's wrong? Yeah, that's right. That's not why they brought him to Jesus at all. In fact, this is interesting. The Bible says in verse 7, when he, Jesus, saw their faith, that is what they believed in. You want to look at it? Look down at the Bible in verse 7. Excuse me, um, it's up before verse 7, uh, verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, take up thy bed and go thy way and go thine house. Is that what it says? No. no. It says, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. The man was saved in verse 5. In verse 11, he was healed. Look at verse 11. Jesus said, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. Now, why did Jesus heal him? Why did Jesus heal him? Because the Bible says, when Jesus saw their faith, that is, that the four men, and I assume that the palsied man as well, these five men, believed if they just came to Christ, they would have their sins forgiven. Jesus said, Son, your sins are forgiven. And when he said that, the religious men standing around said, wait just a second here. Who has the right to forgive sins but God only? They didn't say that. They thought that. And Jesus being God and perceiving their thoughts said, why do you reason these things in your heart? Which would be easier? For me to say, your sins are forgiven, that would be a miracle, would it not? Yes. yes. Or for me to say, take up your bed and walk, that would be a miracle, would it not? So Jesus said, that ye may know that the Son of Man, that's Christ, hath power to forgive sins. Not to heal, but to forgive sins. He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. Now, now look, this is important. Jesus healed the man so that people would see he had the power and the right to forgive men of sins. Do you see that in the passage? Yes. Okay, it's really very clear, isn't it? Yes. Well, why did we all say then they brought him there to be healed? That's right. Well, there are two reasons, all right? One is you got a crooked preacher because <laughs> I led you on. I said, this is the story of a man being healed. It's not. I said, the man was crippled and he couldn't walk and he had four friends that brought him to Jesus. Well, that's true, but it's not the point of the story. Um, I said, uh, in this healing, uh, this poor man who was carried in walked, uh, essentially, I said, walked out. I did say all that. And so I centered our thinking on the healing when that's not what the passage does. Right. The passage centers our thinking on his having his sins forgiven. Now you know what this means among many things? This means that sins being forgiven is more important than a body being whole. Amen. How important is it that a body is whole? Well, I think, I think it's real important, don't you? None of us would say, you know, I don't care if I'm sick or well. Doesn't make any difference to me, flu, cold, whatever. If I'm sick, that's fine. If I'm well, that's fine. Wouldn't all of us have a preference between being sick and being well? Yes. Isn't being well a good thing? 
Don't, don't we, when we come to prayer meeting on Wednesday night, often hear requests of people that are sick? I've, I've heard of two friends. One really is not a close friend. I don't know her well, but the other is a very dear friend of mine. And this week, I heard about both of these friend, friends being diagnosed with cancer. And so I've been very, very much aware of my friends, well, specifically the one who has cancer. I've prayed for him every day. And I've called him, I guess, this past week uh, three times. And Mary and I have talked about him. And I talked to another friend about him last night. And my other friend said, you know, uh, my wife and I have been praying for him every day. Well, that makes sense, doesn't it? If you have a friend and he comes down with a disease that's very serious and could be terminal, wouldn't all of us be burdened for him and pray for him? Yeah, because health is very important. But it's not as important as having your sins forgiven. This church doesn't exist so that people can be healthy. Those this church would have a burden for health, don't you think? I mean, we would pray for health, wouldn't we? But that's not the reason this church exists. This church exists so that people can have their sins forgiven. Now let me ask you a question, and basically we'll be finished, all right? Uh, you're, you're fairly healthy, aren't you? Oh, you're here this morning, aren't you? How, how many of you people have had are you planning to have at some point the flu? Can I see your hand? <laughs> have any of you had the flu? Okay, all right. Um, how many of you feel really good today, but you're, you know, you're basically a realist or even a pessimist, and you, you, you are sure that you're going to get sick at some point in the future? Okay. How many of you believe, you don't have to raise your hand on this one, that at some time you will get sick and croak? That means die. The pastor is very excited about that. All right. Well, won't all of us? Won't all of us die at some point? Now, I know it's not sure to think of, but won't all of us die at some I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, Brother Rice, you're, you're nearer to it than I am. <laughs> but none of us know that. None of us know that. I mean, we're all going to die, are we not? What if I prayed for and received great health and lived to be, let's say 90. My mother uh, died a year and a half ago and she was 101. She was almost 102. So what if I lived to be 90 years of age and what if I had perfect health and at 90 years of age I died but I had never had my sins forgiven? Would we all be thrilled or saddened by that? In other words, would you say, well, you know, Bill lived for 90 years and he had great health all 90 years. What difference would that make if I had died and gone to hell? You see this? What if I prayed for you? And I, I, I wouldn't have the authority to do this, but what if just as a friend, what if I said, I'm going to pray that you have great health for the next 20 years. Now, I could pray that, but what if I could guarantee it? I'm going to pray that you'll have health for the next 20 years. And suppose my prayer was answered and you had complete health, you had wonderful health, you had perfect health for the next 20 years, but your sins weren't forgiven. Suppose you died then in your sins in 20 years and went to hell. Let me ask you a question. In the light of eternity, that means never ending. If I live for 70 or 80 or 90 or even 100 years and do well and am healthy, but then die and go to hell, what kind of sense would that make? What if I were sickly? and lived to be 30 or 40 or 50, and I struggled for health all of my life, but I knew Christ and had my sins forgiven and died and went to heaven. 
I'd say I'd be in pretty good shape, wouldn't you? Yeah. yeah. Just now, I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be worried about health. That's fine. Mm -hmm. I'm saying that being healthy and not having sins forgiven is the life of a very foolish person. Right. Nothing is more important than your being right with God in the sin question. Now, how was this man, how did he have his sins forgiven? It's really simple. The Bible says when Jesus saw their faith. Faith in what? Yeah. Belief in what? Belief that his, the palsied man, his sins could be forgiven by Jesus Christ. In other words, this man who was palsied believed on, he trusted in Christ to do for him what he couldn't do for himself. The Bible says, But to as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. The Bible says, And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Eternal life comes when one believes, trusts, rests upon, relies on Jesus Christ to do for him what he can't do for himself. Suppose you said to me, Bill, do you think you can get to heaven? My answer would be no. I can't. I don't even know where it is. I know it's, it's in the heavens. I know we would say it's up. But you know, the earth rotates every 24 hours. And so up in the heavens right now is not going to be where up in the heavens is in 12 hours, is it? Um, I live in Tennessee. It's north of here and slightly west. I don't know how far west, but far enough that we're in the central time zone. So the earth is a globe, is it not? So if you have this globe, and uh, let, let's make it this way. If, if this is Lauderdale and this is Nashville, up from Nashville would be different than up from Lauderdale, wouldn't it? I don't know exactly where heaven is. If I knew where it was, I don't have the vehicle to get me there. Now, I own a car, but unfortunately, it can't fly. And if you owned a plane, it couldn't go out of the atmosphere. And if you owned a rocket ship, which none of us do, you couldn't live in it. To get your, how would you get to heaven? I don't even know where it is. So here, here's, here's what I've done. I've trusted in Christ who bought and paid for eternal life to do for me what I cannot do for myself. You can do that as well. Yeah. And if you've never trusted in Christ, you should. And here's the second application I'd like to make just quickly. If all of us are concerned about our friends and their health, shouldn't all of us be concerned about our friends and whether or not they put their trust and faith in Christ. Wouldn't that be important? Here's a man who came to Jesus. He had four friends that bought him. They brought him because they believed if they just got their friend to Christ, he would be saved. The icing on the cake is that Jesus had already to prove to the doubters that he had the right to save, also heal this man. Now, I'm sure this man right now, who's with Christ in glory, I'm sure he's thankful he was healed. Don't you think so? Mm -hmm. well, what do you think he's most thankful for? That his sins were forgiven. If you're healthy enough to be here, that's great. Have you ever had your sins forgiven? If not, you can. And you can this morning and you can right now in this place where you sit by simply trusting, believing in, receiving Christ to do for you what you can't do for yourself when it comes to the sin problem. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to ask the pastor to stand with me. And Brother Frank will be up here as well. And I'm not going to point anybody out. Would you mind just sitting up real good and straight? If you'll do that, it'll, it'll help you to stay uh, awake. Our heads are bowed. I'm not, I'm not going to embarrass anyone. I know, I know you would recognize that, but I'm just telling you.
so you can be confident of it. I won't point you out, but I would like to ask you a couple of questions, and if you so desire, you can respond by simply raising a hand, all right? Number one, I wonder if you're here and you'd say, Bill, I'm healthy enough to be in church today, but I can't say I know my sins are forgiven. If I died today, I don't know that I would be in heaven. I'd like to know that, but I don't know that. But I want to know it, and I would like to believe on Christ, to trust Him for my salvation, just like this paralytic this man did. So here's what you're saying. Bill, I'm in church today, and that's fine. I'm glad to be here, but I don't know that my sins are forgiven. I don't know I'm on my way to heaven. If I were to die today or 30 years from today, I don't know that I would go to heaven. But I'd like to know that, and I'd like to know my sins are forgiven. And you'd say this, Bill and Pastor, would you pray with me, please, and for me? Not only will we pray for you, but we'll encourage you to pray for yourself. Right where you're sitting. All right? So if you're here and you'd say, I can't say I know I'm saved, but I'd like to know that. Pray with me and for me. Would you slip a hand up right this second where you're seated? Just slip it up where you are until I see it, and then you can take it down. We'll wait just a moment. Anyone at all? How, how many folks here could say, Bill, I may not be all I should be, uh, but I have trusted the Lord Jesus. I've asked Him to forgive my sins, and I know my sins are forgiven, and I know I'm on my way to heaven. Would you slip a hand up where you're seated? Real high. Real high, just for a second, all right? Wonderful. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Now, have I missed anyone? Is there anyone here who could say, Bill, I can't say I know my sins are forgiven, and I can't say I know I'm on my way to heaven, but I would like to know that. Pray with me and for me. I would like to know that. Anyone else at all? Would you slip a hand up? Is there anyone else at all? Let me wait just a moment. Anyone else? Okay, one more question. How many people here would say, you know, uh, Brother Bill, I've often been concerned that people have health, and I pray for that, and of course that's good. But you'd say, you know, I've not been very concerned of late that people come to know Christ. And I haven't been praying that people would come to know the Lord Jesus, and I've not been witnessing so that people would know that they need the Lord Jesus to forgive their sins. And you'd say, God spoke to my heart this morning. As we read from Mark chapter 2, God spoke to my heart about the matter of telling people how they can know their sins are forgiven, of giving out tracts, of witnessing, of encouraging people to trust the Lord Jesus. And you'd say, I want this day to be a turning point in my life. I want to leave this service determined with God's help and by God's grace to be the witness I should be. And you'd say, pray with me about that. Would you slip a hand up where you're seated? Well, yes, God bless you. Wonderful, wonderful, yes, God bless you. You can put them down, you can put them down. Anyone else at all? Anyone else? Okay, you wanna look this way? Well, look this way. I'm going to tell you exactly what we're going to do. We're going to have a word of prayer. And I think if I ask everybody that raised your hand to come to the front and pray, I'm, I'm sure you would do that. But uh, let, let's do this a little differently this morning. All right? In just a moment, we're going to bow for prayer. And when we do, I think most of you raised a hand saying, I, I, I'd like to be burden for lost people and be effective in witnessing. Isn't that what most of us raise our hand about? So let's do this. We're going to bow for prayer and if God spoke in your heart, I'm going to ask you to stand. That is, if God spoke specifically and you raised your hand for prayer, I'll ask you right where you are just to stand. Then I'll pray for all of us and then you pray for yourself right where you are. Don't pray out loud. Just pray um, if you would in your own heart and quietly. And then when you're finished praying, you'll be seated. This make sense? We'll bow for prayer in a moment. If God spoke to your heart, you stand your feet right where you are. I'll pray for all of us. Then you pray for yourself. When you're finished, you just be seated. When the last person's been seated, uh, Pastor Price will come and uh, dismiss, I assume, the service. Does that make sense? Okay.
Let's do that. So we will bow together for prayer. And if God spoke in your heart, you'd like to you just stand your feet right now where you are. Just stand your feet and I'll pray with and for you. All right. There's six. Any others? There's seven. There's eight. That's good. There's nine. Okay, anyone else? Father, you know hearts. I know that. And you know, uh, just as you did, Lord Jesus, when these men reasoned the wrong things in their hearts, you know our hearts. And so I pray for these dear people who are standing. Help them as they come to you in prayer silently in just a moment and grant their request as we know you will. We pray for Jesus' sake. Your heads are bowed. You pray when you're finished, you just be seated. We'll look right this way. We'll look right this way. We wound up with 10 people standing to ask God's help, and that's wonderful. I'm very thankful for that. Let me just encourage you. If you want to be a witness, you can be. And if you feel a little uh, unprepared or you have concerns or qualms, that's why we've got a church, and uh, Pastor Price can help you with that. And you, you can witness by giving out tracts, by telling people how to be saved. And you know, if you witness, you'll see people come to Christ. You will. And so... That's what we'll pray for on your behalf. May God bless you, Pastor. I want to remind you about the opportunities this afternoon and this evening. We are going to be going down to Miami Beach this afternoon. Brother Frank Finney will be uh, teaching Sunday school and preaching the Miami Beach service. And so we'll be heading down that way. If you'd like to catch a ride with someone, please let us know. And that's another opportunity. I like to go to church all day. I think it's a lot of fun. Matter of fact, uh, the reality of it is... Uh, it's, it's sort of a dream. I've had people ask me a lot of times, Pastor, why, why did the early church meet every day? Why don't we meet every day? And I've always thought it's a great question, actually. Now, I've realized that if you do anything else all day long and then you meet, boy, well, I can get pretty tired. You can be pretty tired after a while. But, you know, I know people that actually almost every single week are in services every single night, and I notice they seem to be doing pretty well. And so I enjoy it, and I look forward to it. So we have... Uh, special speakers come, like the Finney family or uh, the Dr. Bill Rice and, and uh, his family. It's a great opportunity to hear preaching. So I'd encourage you not only to be there this afternoon, but if you can't make it to Miami Beach, it's too much, go home and get a really good nap. And then uh, be back here at 6 p.m. Also, could you do me some, a favor this afternoon? A lot of times I'm busy, uh, believe it or not, on Sunday afternoons, and I can't call everybody. But there's a lot of folks that are missing this morning. Now, some of them I know where they're at. So I know some folks that are on a trip, and uh, but there are some folks that I don't know where they are. And so if you'd give them a call and say, you missed out, but you haven't missed everything. There's a service tonight, and then you can come to that. Also, I did not mention that this week our Tuesday night visitation will be as usual at 6.30 p.m. We do everything we can to not cancel that. And we actually had mostly daylight last uh, Tuesday night when we went out. We've been going to well-lit places and doing our soul winning so that we didn't have to cancel it this year. But it's starting to be daylight, folks, and then daylight savings is coming up as well. And so if darkness and the fear of it has been <laughs> keeping you from going soul winning with us, please come out Tuesday evening at 6.30 p.m. And, man, we've had a great time. 
even when we have a bad time, it's a good time. This last Tuesday evening, it was the first time in a very, very long time that somebody's been mean. We had a lady who was just angry. I think she's a Trump supporter. That's what I told her. She must be a Trump supporter. <laughs> You're so angry. And that made her angrier. I don't know why. But <laughs> anyway, we really, uh, honestly, folks, hey, hey, listen, if you ever want to just have a good time with somebody, just call them a Trump supporter, especially if you think they might not be. And you'd be surprised at how much fun it is. Uh, seriously, we, uh, we, we just, every time we go out, when we come get back in the bus together, everyone shares, hey, you know what, I got to talk to this person, and this is the conversation we had, and I got to share the gospel. This person says they're going to come. And just every time we go, God works. And so please be part of that. Also read the bulletin. There's some announce announcements in there, some things that are coming up that uh, we need you to be involved in. There's a lot of good information in there for you as well. Thank you, Dr. Bill, for Amen. preaching to us this morning and for preaching a clear uh, gospel message. Dr. Bill's my favorite preacher. I've admitted that before. He's Miss Mary's favorite preacher too, isn't he? And she knows him. And so uh, <laughs> uh, I, I love having them. And uh, so you, you let folks know and be here tonight at 6 p.m. Cancel something if you have to so that you can make it. Let's dismiss with prayer, shall we? Father, thanks so much for being so good and gracious to us. Thank you for the message this morning. God, that clarifies our need. Look, it really is a greater cost for our Savior Amen. to die for our sin Amen. than it is for Him to do something that is just in His character, be supernatural. And so, Lord, I just thank you for your sacrifice that proves your love for us. I pray that the reality of that would really connect with our hearts. Amen. And we'd respond to it. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.